the wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week, and what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in a car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you, and walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I don't like to be spit on. Nicky Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nicky, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nicky, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I could say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades, and he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did, went home, and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you are a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Arkansas, I met 28 years or, or 30 years ago down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name. I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. And she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home, change your shirt, let me give you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family, had no thoughts of God, been shot at, in and out of prison. But I'll never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the center, remembering that, that, just that one statement, Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, someone had gone to him, told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat. Because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, lays hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellas from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics. Many of you, not even in Teen Child, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless. But the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus when you first heard of it? What a flush of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea... That because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer and for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me. Traveling, trying to raise funds. Trying to keep the whole thing afloat. And centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and in, in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting. And I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart. You love him with everything that's in you. And, and you fast, you pray, you seek him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did. Drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up, Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought, how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. I'm standing there after the meeting in despair watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital, she was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus, and had, had about 30 pounds of water on her and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't, after all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, 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 she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what you know, I did? I closed it and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still let me love you. So help me, the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put a scripture, a Psalms, so and so and I went there. And you know what it said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. It was the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this on my heart, and it's why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're, we're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow. And you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped. You have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, in, in, it was originally said, that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, does not mean you're damned or you're lost or outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time of, for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord saying, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. Why don't you go to Romans 8? Why don't you go to Romans 8? The 8th chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because here, I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. Yeah. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely to me. You came to the Lord. He decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord, and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you, and he engraved you in the palm of his hand, and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it till the day of Christ. You're not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil, you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be holy, you'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach, you can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach and say, oh, I'll never, I can't measure up. There's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, are you going to do it? Uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they say, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil and you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness and the devil's going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've got... We've got a Tom condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan. And you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I, I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him. You say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them. But all along they were my children and I loved them. And the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorcement? Say, I divorce you. Go on out on your own. When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles. I'm going through your trial. Hold fast. Now, notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolate it as an island. Some of you sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You felt isolated. And you, 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 feel what, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us, and my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb? Yea, they may forget Yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. And the Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I want to tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone. He says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there was terror in Bob and in my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man or, or, or that man that preaches a message that pictures Jesus only as a hard man because that produces fear and fear has torment and then people go and hide. Because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those preachers. You know, there are times when I, well, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, Brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes, Pastor, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls, you know, skinning i tell you what, I thundered and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did. And later some pastors said, boy, you were hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something in them. They wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or something. Yeah, there. give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid, so afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carrying all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I, wanted, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of their children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishes her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God, which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness. Preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children, not trying to whip you, not trying to drive you, but to go to the throne of God Touch his righteousness. Touch his holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here he is. In all of his love, he hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel his wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to his children. And I confess before a holy God I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in his fullness. Sometimes we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. And then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he'd been speaking all week to me, so strong. How serious this matter is, is how, of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present him. Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of him. There, there's a, down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a, one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's their vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be pitiful, be courteous. First Peter 3 8. Do you know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, or if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting him in his fullness? Or are you just showing one side of him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve... Two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box that we carried in. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You're shaking an accusing finger in their face. And this Lord who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority, Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply, Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient, patient, and understanding. You know what the Scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long-suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long-suffering. Paul preached with that long-suffering. He said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long-suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul is a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this, he's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church? Look at verse... Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking the Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were either cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20. He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spill you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spill you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backslided, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spill you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He doesn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spill you out of my mouth, I would have had scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in his fullness. I would have missed. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spill you out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spill my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times. Look, I've tried. I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows where I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And I mean, most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, didn't, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. Oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes, I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. <laughs> I've grieved the Lord. I shouldn't have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of his grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know he's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. You remember, you remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You ever been there? Far? Some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't... I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else. But I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? What was his father? His father was looking for him. Waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you. But he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself. Say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you, you see the picture, the composite picture. And one day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You in the balcony here, down on the main floor, you have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. Do. He, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Where are your accusers? He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. You know, the, that's Jesus. That he comes after you, take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father didn't go up to him and says, you spent every, look at it, I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you, it's been there all the time. You're a brother, you're older brother, you ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Well, that's not what he told him. What'd he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes and he said to his servants, take those clothes, put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. The Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, Father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the Father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. and says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you, it's very simple. Per, bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you and come to me I'll receive you I'll make you righteous all you have to do is get up and come come home come home come home Lord Jesus I feel your love tonight for this people truly you love us you love us with an undying love Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. If God, by His Spirit, touched you tonight, and the Holy Spirit has said, this message is for you, and you've, you've been backslidden in heart, or you're carrying God's grief over his people. Heavenly Father, I want you to speak to us this morning. 
I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to all of us about your grief over us. Hallelujah. Amen. Before I start, uh, when I was uh, at Swaggart Sunday night, uh, a group called the Singing Rambos did the music. Uh, Reba Rambo and her husband. And uh, we went out to eat after. And they began to testify how their life had been so changed last week by a miracle. They have a lady friend in California who is dying of cancer, terminal cancer. It's her third operation. She's lost her hair three times. And she's terminal. And she prayed, Lord, before I die, I want to see you. I want you to come to my room. I want you to talk to me. I want you to meet me. And the Lord, through prayer, appeared to her. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared in her room. And her hands were so cold, and he was just massaging her hand and said, Dearest, come with me. And took her on a four-hour journey over green pastures and over still waters as far as the eye could see, and then sat beside a still water and green pastures and began to unburden his heart to her. Her name was Lucy, and he said, Lucy, I'm a bridegroom, and the reason I want a bride is because I need love. I need to be loved just as sure as you need to be loved. And he, with tears in his eyes, he said, I'm wearied of my bride. I'm wearied of my bride. My bride is careless. My bride doesn't love me anymore. They talk about loving me, but my bride doesn't love me anymore. And I'll tell you, she, uh, the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm going to give you a little more time. And I'm going to linger in your room with my presence and touch everybody who comes in your room to hear this message. And their life will be changed, and I want this message to spread. Your pastor and everyone who comes in the room. And the glow of the Lord after seven days is still in that room. Doctors, nurses, everyone are trying to get into that room. Rambo said when we walked in that room, suddenly it was revealed to us how shallow our lives are. And we were convicted and stirred. She just lays in the bed with that glow on her face and tells everybody in the room, Jesus is weary of his bride. Get ready, get prepared, begin to love him. The pastor was moved, stood in the pulpit and told about it. And now all over Southern California, that word is spreading. And one woman who has seen Christ and in the same message, when they were saying that, that witnessed to me, all oh, that witnessed to me, Jesus says, I'm wearied of my bride. And I was praying last night and the Lord gave me a message, God's grief over his bride, God's grief over his people. Now, you know the final outcome of the church of Jesus Christ is one of victory. You know the final outcome is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That's the final outcome. There's nothing going to change that. That's final. God is going to be victorious in the end. But in the meantime, remember the flood that Satan sent out against the angel and for a season prevailed against the woman in the wilderness? Now, I want to talk about this this morning. We're supposed to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed and secured by the blood. But anybody with any spiritual discernment at all know that the church of Jesus Christ is not where it should be. We all know it. And there is not a word, there's not a person here that doesn't discern it. Satan is trampling over God's people almost at will. Gwen and I read thousands of letters. Gwen reads eight and ten hours a day of letters coming from all over the United States. Some of you that are on our staff right now know what's happened. We sent out a prayer request letter, a sheet, where people could just request prayer. And how many, I don't know, we probably had four to 5,000 just last week. And the first few days, over 100 of them from women whose husbands, Christian husbands are leaving them. Broken homes. And Gwen and I, uh, uh, I'll be studying and I'll be in prayer. And she'll say, honey, please listen to this. And she begins to pour it out. Here's a minister, somebody of God's minister. His wife has just run off with another man. Left him with two children. He's about to give up his ministry. You, you, here, here are grandparents saying, my grandchildren don't talk to me anymore. They're supposed to be Christian. Here's a letter from a pastor from New York. says, in New Jersey... Uh, a group that used to be connected with uh, a printing company, Charismatic. They began to have these choreo choreographer dances in the church. Now they've moved into ballroom dancing in the church, the sector music, and bringing bands in. 
And he said, then they sing and shout and talk in tongues, and then Saturday nights are having their, their ballroom dancing. And now it's sweeping all through the East Coast. And, and you, you get letters and you read these things and you see Satan trampling over God's house at will. Just walking over his people. Walking at will. And, and you, there's, you go to prayer and there's a holy indignity comes upon you. And you say, Lord, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Children rebelling and backsliding. Chaos in the homes. It was for a while just husbands leaving wives, but now wives leaving husbands. The backsliding is so widespread, it's a pandemic thing that's happening, backsliding beyond anything this nation has ever seen. All across America, there, around the world, there are probably over 350, maybe 400 teen challenge centers taking in drug addicts and alcoholics, and all of our people are on their knees seeking God because of the widespread backsliding. Many have been converts who walked through the program and now backsliding, turning their back on the Lord. And we detect in these letters a sense of helplessness. So many people giving up hope and a loss of joy and victory in their lives. A sense of being defeated and cast down, defenseless, trodden down and wearied and troubled in mind. And there's something in me that says, Lord, why is the devil wreaking such havoc among God's people? And my grief, I believe, only reflects a little bit of the grief of God over the pitiful condition of the life and the homes of God's people. God does grieve over his people. He grieved for 40 years over Israel. Listen to it. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? God was what? He was grieved. Don't tell me God doesn't grieve. He said, with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was he not grieved with them that sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. And this is an amazing thing. This is the people God promised to carry like a father carries a son in his arms. He said, I'll carry you in my arms. I'll take you through the Red Sea. I'll take you through the wilderness. And I'll plant you in a good land. He promised to be their guide, their keeper, their shelter, their strong arm. And I've just written down some of the things I've found in the Old Testament. He said, I'll be your covert from every storm. I'll be your deliverer from every enemy. I'll be your high tower of protection. He said, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. I'll keep you as the apple of my eye, the delight of my soul, the object of my tender loving care. Your enemies will be your footstool. You will be not just conqueror, but more than conqueror. And listen to this, what God is saying. I'll carry you like a father carries a son. No enemy shall prosper against you. I'll make you victorious in all things. I'll make every enemy your footstool. And had they only believed that, they would have lived a life of victory and joy, and they would have moved into a promised land and had victory all their lifetime. Had they simply believed his promises and rested in his mighty power, they would have been an invincible people. They could have walked through that perilous wilderness well-fed, without thirst, without fear or despair, with every need supplied, with a song in their heart and great joy. They could have lived a life of peace and rest and victory and moved into a land of promise. And every tear would have been wiped away. Now, that was God's plan. Why would God take a people out of the brick hills of Egypt? Why would he move them through the Red Sea? Why would he allow them to go through all this but to prepare them a good land? God never intended we live like we do. Never. That's never been God's plan. It's been unbelief that destroyed the whole plan of God in Israel. Unbelief blinded the eyes of the people toward the ways of God. They missed God's plan simply because they would not believe his word is true. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now it wasn't just their lust that kept them out. It wasn't just dancing around the golden calf. It wasn't because they were neighing after each other's wives. It was beyond that. You see, God was forgiving to their sins. He had a Passover lamb and our Savior was always, he's been merciful and forgiving to our sins. It wasn't just lust. It was something beyond that. It's the one thing that God sees in all of us far beyond lust, far beyond all of these petty things of the flesh. Oh, there was no problem with David finding forgiveness 
Forgiveness is not the problem. It's our unbelief. It's our lack of confidence, our lack of trust in the Lord. It was this blatant unbelief that tied God's hands so he could no longer help them. He could no longer deliver Israel. Unbelief robbed them of every promise God made to them. It closed the door of fullness and joy. They began to even doubt that God loved them, that God was involved in their life. They questioned his mercy. And they began to turn inward to help themselves. And we look over, you know, I was looking over yesterday the pitiful history of Israel in this wilderness. And I say to myself, and I, I stood to my feet and I was walking around. Uh, I have a room up top of my garage. And I'm walking around there in the presence of the Lord. Every time I walk in, I meet him there. And I was looking at this and I said, oh God, what a waste. What a waste. Only Joshua and Caleb and Moses. Only three remained true of that whole tribe of Israel. What it could have been if they would have simply believed God. They didn't have to live in bondage. They didn't have to live in fear and trouble. That was all self-inflicted. They could have chosen God's way they are wasted in a wilderness, God forsaken, because of nothing short of unbelief. God grieves even more over this generation because of our unbelief, because we have better promises than Israel had, we still be believe not. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you seem to come short of it. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. And there you have it. Think for a moment of God's grief when he sees what's happening to American Christian homes in our lives. When he says, Israel didn't have an example like you have. They couldn't pick up a Bible. They couldn't pick up a testimony and learn of a people that could have had everything and backslid because of unbelief. They don't have an example. But you have an example, he says. We have an example of what happens to a people who won't believe God's word. And he said, are you going to fail after the same example of unbelief as Israel? And that's what God said to me yesterday. David, do you believe me? When you come into the presence of the Lord, then you make your petitions known. Do you believe that King Jesus at that very moment hears you? The eyes of the Lord and the righteous and his ears open to their prayers. Do you believe that God is at work that very moment? I was praying at that particular time when God was speaking that to my heart about my son and uh, pastor's uh, primarily black church in Detroit. He's about 26 years old and I, I pray from night and day because of the powers of Satan all around that wicked city. And, and the physical harm and danger all around. And I prayed for him and God said, you believe that while I'm praying right now that I am at work in your boy's life and in his church, that right now while you pray, I've dispatched an army of angels and I'm at work. You believe it? And I said, yes, I do. We have a house for sale. We used to live in a big house and we just said we can't live there anymore so we had it up for sale. It's been there for a year. And I've been praying about the Lord said, you believe I'm able to raise up a stone and turn it into a buyer? Yes. Because he can make the stones rise up and praise him. And the Lord said, if you believe I can make a stone into a buyer, I'll give you a buyer. You have to believe that. Do you believe? Do you believe his word? Do you believe when he said, ask and you shall receive? Do you believe he means that? Hmm. Very few of us believe it. Very few of us live it. God's saying it should be different now. You've got my promise to bring you into a place of perfect peace and rest if you'll only believe. You've got the example here of Israel of what happened to them. <sighs> detailed. Look at it. It's all detailed. Go and read it. Read it once again and, and picture yourself and say, here, here it is. I have this example. And yet I'm doing the same stupid things they did. I'm not believing just like they didn't. God says, listen, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We have a high priest now, not like Israel. We have a high priest that's passed into the heavens. 
We have a high priest that's seated behind, beside the right hand of God. We have a high priest that's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And while I'm talking to you right now, he is touched with the feeling of everything you and I are going through. He's touched with it. He knows it. And he said, you have something better than they did. They had priests that died. They had priests that couldn't feel. They had priests that couldn't read their mind. You have a high priest who's ascended to the Father and he's seated at the right hand of the, of the Father. He's seated on his kingly throne. He's not only king, he's an assessor, he's high priest. And he says, come to this high priest, come to him in full confidence. Come to him to receive mercy and grace to help in your time of need. Yet we act like we have no king. We act like we've been abandoned. We go into God's presence and like beggars, we go into him like he's uh, somebody just floating around in his spirit. We've got to wake him up to get his attention. No. He says, do you believe me? Do you trust me? Why do you pray? Why do you talk to me if you don't believe that I'm going to answer? Why do you talk? Why do you worship me if you don't believe that I'm real? So often we bind God's hands. We bind him. It was so when Jesus walked in the flesh, he went to his own country, the scripture said, among his own people, and listened to this. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, listen to that. They tied the hands of Almighty God. God couldn't work. God couldn't work in Israel because of unbelief. Jesus, the Son of God, the miracle worker, could do no mighty works in there is because of their unbelief. And we tie his hands the same way. We tie him up. You know, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would. He kept saying, I would. I would have gathered you as a mother. Gathered you. I would, but you would not. And you hear it all through. I would, but you wouldn't. I would, but you wouldn't. I hear that all through the Bible. Every time I read it now, I'm more willing to give than you are to receive. I'll do it. I will. I'm willing. I'm willing. But you're not. Your unbelief has tied me. Your unbelief stands, hinders me from doing what I need to do. In these last days, those who've not learned to trust the Lord in everything are going to be consumed when the troubles really begin to flow. All the Israelites who come out of Egypt except Joshua and Caleb were consumed in this terrible wilderness. Before he died, Moses told them why God was going to leave them alone. Moses predicted, he prophesied, he said, you're all going to die in this terrible wilderness. You're going to die here. You're going to die miserable lives. And then he told them why. He said, God promised to fight your battles. He bore thee in his arms as a man doth bear his son. Yet all, after all this, you did not believe the Lord your God. Let me read it to you again. This is Deuteronomy 1, 30 and 32. Listen. God promised to fight your battles. He bore you in his arms as a man that bear his son. Yet all after all of this, you did not believe the Lord your God. And then Moses said, And the Lord heard the voice of your words. And he was angry. And he swore, saying, Surely these shall, there shall not one of this evil generation see that good land. Turn you and take your journey back into the wilderness. Go not up, neither fight, for I'm not among you anymore. The Lord will not hearken or give ear to you anymore. Oh, that's powerful. That's frightening. God's saying to his children, go back. Die in the wilderness because you don't believe me. I tried to bear you. I tried to walk with you. I made your promises and you won't believe me. And I heard your thoughts because our thoughts are words. I heard what you were thinking. I, I can tell when my wife's thinking. I said, honey, come on, get it out. I know what you're thinking. And she said, I'm not thinking anything, but if I'll just wait long enough and press in, it'll come out. And the Lord says, I know what you're thinking. And you know, we, we, we get the idea, well, well, Lord, we're just human, we're just frail, and you, you don't mind these fleeting thoughts of doubt and unbelief. And God says, no, I heard you. I heard your words. I heard what you said in your tent. I heard what you said in your room. I heard what you said in the imagination of your heart. And I was angry by what you said. And because you've said in your heart that I'm not with you, because you questioned me, go back into your wilderness. Go back. And I'm not going with you anymore. I'll not hear you anymore because 
The more I talk to you, the more I promise you, the less you love me, the less you believe me. All sense of God, beware of the language of your heart. Beware of the language of your mind. Do you really believe that when he said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him? Do you believe that? Do you believe that this past week when the devil came against you like a flood, that the Spirit of the Lord was right there at work, though you didn't see him, raising up a standard, his holy standard? Or were you saying, God, where are you? Why did this happen? Are you throwing him a bundle of questions? Now, it's a great evil in the eyes of the Lord to speak doubt about his love or care for you. Now, I want you to listen to this. Isaiah, now, just, just look at me. Give me your good eye because I want to share something from my heart. Isaiah said, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. Now, listen. Who is he talking about? Lift up your trumpet, blow the horn, show my people their transgressions. Now, this, this blew my mind when I saw it. I'm speaking from Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Now, here, here's, the, here's the tragedy. He's talking to a people who love to seek God. He's not talking to prostitutes. He's not talking to alcoholics. He's not even talking to backslidden Christians. He's talking to those who are supposed to be on fire for God. Listen to it amazingly. He said he's talking to those... And this is in Isaiah 51, 2. He's speaking to those who sought the Lord daily, who delighted to know his ways. Listen to it. He said, he's speaking to those who sought the Lord daily, who delighted to know his ways, who did righteously, who forsook not the ordinances of their God, and took delight in poaching to the Lord. They took delight in poaching to God. They delighted to go to prayer. They loved God, and yet he's saying to them, show them their transgressions. Show them their sin. And I say to myself, oh God, how do you show people sin who are beginning to seek you with all their heart and mind and soul and strength and they're saying, oh God, stir me, and they delight to pray. They love God. They delight in his presence. And here's the prophet Isaiah saying, go tell them their transgressions. Show them their sins. And what is the sin? Huh? Here's the very best, the very chosen of God, and yet they're guilty of a grievous sin, and it's a sin of unbelief. You find it in the third verse. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Here are people of praying, here are people delighting in seeking the Lord, and yet when they go home, Yet there's something over and above it all that's saying, maybe this doesn't pay. Where is the sign? Where's the evidence of his working in my life? They're saying, and, and they're listening to the lies of the devil. The devil came in. This is why this message is so important to me because I've just experienced this. I've just gone through it. The Lord showed me my transgressions. Showed me that my last idol was not television. It was nothing else but unbelief. Unbelief. It's an idol in all of us. Listen to me now. Listen good. God showed me my unbelief. Because during that time, I was listening to these subtle little things. You know, the biggest lie the devil will tell you in that is that God's grace is so great and so mighty, you can do almost anything and be forgiven. He'll turn the grace of God into lasciviousness right before your eyes. And I'll tell you what it did to me. For some reason or other, I picked up Luther's book on Galatians. And I'm reading there, and Martin Luther is saying, God's grace is so great that your sin is no longer sin in his eyes. And the old devil says, that's Martin Luther. And he's saying, God's grace is so great, and the Lord is so forgiving, that even though you sin, it's not sin in his eyes anymore. Is a lie, but it's a subtle thing. And, and suddenly the devil says, see, who are you? Who are you to live such a straight life and preach such a doctrine of holiness? Who are you? When the mighty Martin Luther, and you, you know, the sense is, well, just ease up. Just ease up. And that's when the unbelief begins to flood in. 
and say, oh, you know, others are praising the Lord, others are being filled with the Holy Ghost, and they're living, having fun. Now, that's not what I want. I don't want the fun. I've turned my back on all of that. But it's the devil coming and says, go ahead and write your book. Nobody's going to listen. They're going to make fun of you. Why make a fool out of yourself? And that's the way it's going to be for you. You, you. The devil will come to you and say, hey, you started to seek God with all your heart. You're giving him everything now. Some of you have thrown out your television set because you know it's an idol. You know it's the power of the devil's behind it now. And you're cleaning up your lives and you're seeking God. And then the enemy will come in like a flood and say it doesn't pay. What foolishness. Some of you that are working over here for last days, you work 18 hours a day. And the devil will come to you, lay down so tight at night and say you're a fool, you're crazy. Go out and make money. And he'll lie to you. And that's what he's, that, that's, that's what these dear people were saying. Even though they delighted to come into the presence of the Lord, suddenly this thought came to them. Why am I fasting? I don't see evidence. God's not answering my prayer. Where's the evidence? God show me. I'm seeking your faith night and day and I'm praying and I know I'm a man of God. I know I'm a woman of God. But where's the answer? Things are not changing. Show me the evidence. And the devil will make you demand evidence from God. He'll say, if you're a man of God, if you're a praying woman and you believe the prayer works, where's the evidence? Oh, thank God for that scripture says, blessed is he who sees not and yet believes. Hallelujah. Now I told God, I believe him now. I don't care if I see, I don't care if God ever answers prayer again for me. I still believe him. I trust him. It doesn't depend on him answering my prayer anymore. I believe he answers prayer, but I don't have to see that to trust him. Glory be to his matchless name. He'll whisper, it doesn't pay to be so holy and sober and pure. No miracles in your life. Why do you bother? You're just like you were. You're just as cold as ever. You're the same old person you always were. Your troubles and problems are piling up on you. Your fasting doesn't get results. Relax! I'll tell you something. That, that's... Let me tell you the three big lies of the devil right now. Number one, don't judge. And be, behind that, the devil can hide behind that smoke screen and do anything he wants to do. Well, we'd better judge righteous judgment. Peter, or Paul judged Peter for being carried away. Jesus judged. Oh, did he judge? He called them vipers and snakes. And we'd better have a holy wrath of God in our hearts. Don't judge. And the other is legalism. Every time, we Brother Raymond have been talking about it. Every time God speaks his word of separation, here comes not the sinners, but the preachers, legalism. You know, I was down at Freddie Garcia's, our drug addict churches down in uh, San Antonio last week. You know, you, you get 600 of those converted drug addicts together, and you've got a meeting. And 100 of them are pastors that are on fire for God. And I was sharing this chapter about getting rid of your television idols. I've been listening to all those young preachers get up and preach like a house of fire. And then I looked at their pot bellies and I knew what they're doing. They're sitting for three and four hours in front of TV and junk food and getting fat. And, and, oh, did I lose? Okay. And, uh, so I shared, I gave 31 reasons from the Bible, 31 scriptures why we're to get that abomination out of our house. Set no wicked thing before our eyes. Quit sitting in the seat of the scornful. Thou shalt bring no abomination into thy house. Thou hate it, detest it, lest you become a curse like it. And I'll tell you, the Spirit of the Lord moved. One preacher jumped up and ran, got in his car, ran out and smashed the two TV sets and came back. <laughs> now, in my book, I'm suggesting don't do it in public. Now, we shot some 20, we shot $6,000 worth of TV sets here. We shot them with shotguns. And everybody around here laughing about it in the neighborhood, but you know, it's changing now. Nobody's laughing because the Lord's beginning to speak about our separation from all that's of the world. So Freddie got up in his church Friday night. And he, he told all his preachers, go home. I don't care if you have to, how far you go, get your sets. We're burning them all. But he called radio and television, all the cameras, something I didn't want to happen. And I picked it. Oh, they're going to say, Dave Wilson told us to burn our TV sets and the book will be destroyed before it's out. But you know, the, all the television cameras and everything, it, it looks like they're going to burn over 300 sets before it's all over. And uh, they were, there was the, all the TV and it got on national news and they were smashing those TV sets. But you know, here's, here's the sad thing. The, the press carried it with dignity. And, and there was an awesomeness about it. And those hardened 
cameramen were saying it's about time. And the sinners were calling up. Their phones were ringing off the wall. Said if we'd have known that, we'd have brought ours, the sinners. But the preachers in town were screaming, legalism! Legalism! Hmm? But Freddie, oh, I had one pastor after another. I'd sit there listening to their fiery sermons. And I'd have them come up to me later and said, Brother Wilkson, look at this. He said, I got up here and talked about going out winning souls on the street. And I'm sitting three and four hours in front of that thing, losing my soul. I had a young Mexican pastor with me the other day, just pouring out his heart. He said, Brother Wilkson, when I got saved from drugs, I was so on fire, so loving the Lord. He said, just like the rest, I sit down here because I call it relaxation. All idols start with relaxation. That's all they are, the relaxation. They're called diversions. And in this diversion, he said, I've lost everything. My heart went out to him. But you see, this thing, don't judge, and then legalism. And then the third one, and it's worst of all, the worst one. Relax! Relax. You go to California now. The reason I don't go to many churches anymore, the, the drinking is so bad even in Assembly of God churches now. I was talking to Mark, one of our boys here, right front seat here. Mark is a contractor. You know, Mark was telling me in my house last night when he was hiring people out there, they, they, they said if, if, if you get drunk, you're finished. But the Christian contractors, they, they, they allow drinking and he, they were trying to get him to drink. Not the sinners, but the Christians were trying to get him to drink. The Christians were trying to get him drunk. And, and you go to our Pentecostal churches in the West Coast and many of our big cities, and the, congregate, the eyes in the congregation are full of lust, drinking. And like Mark said, they think it's cool now to curse curse, to take God's name in vain. You go to a church social now and they talk about their wine list. They talk about their material things. They talk about everything but Jesus. There was a time that we talked about his name. We glorified his name. And I'll tell you, folks, let me show you. Let me take you just a little further on this for just a minute. God, God is going to try, God is going to have to raise up a people who learn to cast all their cares on him. And if you don't learn to cast every care and trust him in everything, you're not going to be ready for what's coming. I want to, I want to find that scripture here for you. Uh, well, anyhow, it's, it, it's, uh, I think it's Jeremiah. He, he said, if, if you run with the footman and they worry you, if you get overheated running with the footman, what are you going to do in the horse race? And he said, if you are weary in a land of peace and security, what are you going to do when the Jordan swells? In other words, you and I are in a race, aren't we? But it's just a foot race. And if you're not trusting God now, in a land of peace and security where all is well and prosperous, what are you going to do when the economy crashes? What are you going to do when judgment begins to fall like a hammer, one after another? And the oil fields in Iran begin to burn, and the bombs are falling on the oil fields, and the whole nations and congressmen sit there stunned in silence because they don't know what's happening. And Reagan sits there in his desk, turning around, his face ashen white and pale, because he doesn't know what's happening, the suddenness, and the earthquakes begin to come as God's promise. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you can't eat? When you are running in a foot race and you're getting weary and tired and you're not trusting the Lord, how are you going to trust Him when all the apocalyptic horses of Revelation come racing down on this generation? What are you going to do then, he said? If you haven't learned to trust Him now when all is well and peace and calm and all the day is coming, the day is coming, that God's going to have a people and He's preparing them now while there's still a little time left. He's giving us a little space and time to repent to these people to get ready and learn to trust Him and cast every care on Him and say, I believe, I believe He's going to walk me through the fire. And I can give you five promises that God's going to walk us through the fire. I'm going to take you by the hand and walk you through the fire. I don't know one thing. There's not a prophet in this Bible who thunders the Word of God that doesn't preach His grace. 
and not one that doesn't come with that message of hope for God's overcoming people. And the Lord's going to have an overcoming bride. He's getting it ready. We hear the sound of it all over America now. Preachers who are calling. They call Brother Raven Hill. He's got sometimes 15 a day coming over there. These are hungry men that come and say, like a, a preacher just dropped in here Friday, Joe, 500 miles. And he said, I, I'm not leaving till I talk to this man. And I, I tried to take him over to Raven Hills and Friday, but his house was full. So we turned around and came back. And he said, I, I'm so sick and tired. I'm a part of this. We've, our church been a, one of those, they're trying to get him into those satellite church. You know, those crazy satellite church where you just, where you just sit there and, and you let somebody do everything and you become a cripple. Those are abomination in the eyes of God. That's out of the pits of hell. That's right. you and you know something? Listen to me. With all my heart, I say to you, and I, I want this to get through. This man said, Brother Wilkerson, I've got people in my church that don't want to go on with God. They don't want to hear what God's doing in my heart. They want to just, they, they want to know why I'm not choreographer and dancers up in front. They, they want to run out where there's noise. They want to run out where there's excitement. They want to run out where there's only miracles. But when I tell them that God's breaking my heart and I'm weeping between the porch and the altar now, he said, I've got even some of my deacons afraid to hear what God's doing in my heart. And the reason they're afraid, they're sitting in their lives and they're going to have to separate from it. Amen. And God's, he, he said, the truth is though, Brother Wilkes, now I've got a body of believers for since past we've been praying for, we've been waiting for this. And there's a handful only a handful. They're not going to, when the Bible talks about that mighty, that mighty host redeemed in robes of white. Those are remnants from all generations. That's not just this last generation. They're going to be a remnant. They're going to be a handful. And it'll be a glorious. Listen, the only, God's pointing his spirit out all over America and around the world. Right now, the people are responding to the bride. Because they're being awakened and stirred and seeking his heart and giving themselves wholly to the Lord. And I'll, I rejoice this morning that God is raising up a people finally. We're going to be able to look at any fury, look at any storm, look at anything and say, I'm in the palm of his hand. He warned me and I prepared my heart. I've been seeking his face. Now I'll fear no evil. He's got his hand on mine. He's going to walk me through whatever comes. And, it, and listen, if you think we're not going to suffer, you're wrong. We are going to suffer. There's going to be untold suffering. This idea God is going to sweep you away and you're not going to have to do any suffering at all. I don't find that anywhere in my Bible. He's going to take us through what? He said, I'm going to save you in affliction. I'm going to save you in the middle of affliction. But he also said, the wrath of God upon the wicked is the mercy of God on the righteous. You know, I'm, 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 I'm prophesying America is going to be destroyed with hydrogen bombs. And, and I know the whole country is going to laugh and the only people going to hear is the bride. But to me, a holocaust, what is a holocaust? Paul, Peter, the scripture says, if this outward body be dissolved, I've got another one. It just dissolves me into my new body. Hallelujah. Why should I be afraid? Why should I be afraid if bombs are going to fall in America? Because he's going to walk with us. Hallelujah. And some of us had better start disciplining ourselves. We'd better start seeking the Lord. we better start trusting him because we're just in a foot race now, but the red horses. You, you know, the Lord's already mounted all the horsemen. All the apocalyptic horses are already riding out of the chambers of the divine. And they're marching now, right now. I believe they're already in the firmament above this earth. And those trumpets. You know, Sister Basilia Schlink uh, is one of the great saints of America. It's a sisterhood of Lutheran uh, sisters. In, in Darmstadt, Germany, and about 15 years ago, I held a revival over there in Darmstadt with them. And Mother Basilia Slink's probably in her late 70s. And she'll spend eight months a year in a little house in Jerusalem just ministering to the Lord all by herself, just in prayer. And I wouldn't, I don't think I would know any other woman on the face of the earth that I would, I would trust the word more than this dear saint. And I got a call from Germany this past week from Sister Vasilia. She's written many great books. How this woman loves the Lord. 
She can spend 12 hours just saying, I love you, Jesus. And, and you get in her presence, there's just a glow in her face. I, when I ministered there, when Sister Basilia Slick came in the room, I fell on my face for three hours. And I wept because I felt like such a sinner. And then they had a garden out there, and I couldn't even preach until I went out there and had a good long, laid out in the dirt, repented, because I was in the presence of a woman of God. And I got a call. And, and she sent me a tape. Some of us looked at it the other day. It's called Judgment by Fire. And she has seen the judgments of fire coming. She didn't know where. And I said, I believe it's America. And I, I've, I've been in touch now with probably seven of the most praying godly men on the face of the earth. Brother Ravenhill, there's a brother Warnock up in Canada. The brother up in uh, Brother Nelson been praying, what, 20 years he's been on his knees. And these are men who pray night and day. They're at the altar with incense to the Lord. And they said, Brother Dave, I've sent the manuscript, they said, Brother Dave, it should even be stronger. It's coming. It's coming, it's at the door. I, the Lord slew me in prayer and he stood me on my feet in my room and I began to prophesy against the nation. Nobody in the room, just prophesying. And the word that came, the Redeemer's at the door. The Redeemer. Zion has come. Judgment is at the door. Let the redeemed of the Lord rejoice. Hallelujah. Judgment, no, to us it's glory. It's glory. Hallelujah. If you're afraid this morning, you better just get alone with him and say, Jesus, take out all the fear and the anxiety. And my message, look, I, I want to give you just a scripture or two here. But let those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor will thou compass him as with the shield. Listen to this. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest us by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. <laughs> Keep me under the shadow of thy wings. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Now, those that trust in him before the sons of men, thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from all strife. Oh, hallelujah. You believe that? Amen. He, they that put the trust in the Lord are going to be hidden from all the strife that's to come. Hidden in his presence. Oh, we'll have, we'll, there'll be some suffering, yeah. But we're hidden in his presence. He's going to walk with us. How great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which, which thou hast wrought for them that trust thee before the sons of men. I'm closing now, but what I'm saying to you now, what the Lord's wanting me to say to you, is that he wants us as never before to simply cast all our care on him and trust him, say, my God lives. I will not live in fear. I will not live in despair. I'll take dominion in Jesus' name. I'm going to rule and reign with Christ. I'm going to take my place seated with him in heavenly places.